here some of them in the introduction that is starting right now. So we are all really happy to have you here, Professor. Our short virtual slash real floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here and thank you for that very gracious introduction. I will say a few things for perhaps 10, 12 minutes, and then I want to hear what everyone else has to say, the questions, the conversations. This, I believe, is what is most important. For us, world ecology is not a theory, is not a perspective, is a conversation that allows us to theorize, to investigate the world, including the history of the world and the present as a historical moment from the standpoint of a dialectical and historical and geographical engagement with humans in the web of life. So the Capitalocene thesis about which I will speak more in detail in just a moment grows out of this world ecology conversation. And the world ecology conversation insists that the categories of history, including the categories of today's climate crisis, are not man versus nature, but are rather the complex weave of class relations, territorial relations, cultural dynamics with and within webs of life. Of course, in the history of the modern world, this is a history of capitalism as a world ecology of endless capital accumulation, which implies and necessitates the endless domination and transformation of planetary life with, as we are seeing, disastrous and deadly consequences. So for world ecology, capitalism is not primarily or only an economic system. It is not primarily or only a social system. It is those things, but that unfolds within capitalism as a way of organizing the web of life, the relations between humans and the web of life, uh, and the relations of class, of capital, of empire, of culture, so on and so forth. So that every so-called social dynamic in history is irreducibly socio-ecological. That is, uh, as Raymond Williams, the great theorist and novelist, uh, once said, we have mixed our labor with the earth so deeply, so intimately, that it is impossible to draw back and see where the labor ends and the earth begins, where the earth begins and the labor ends. We have a mixing that is uh, uh, the most intimate imaginable. It conjures uh, up the core proposition of dialectics, the interpenetration of seeming opposites. So for world ecology, the critique of man versus nature or nature versus society is one part epistemological and intellectual. And the other part is uh, a, an ideological critique. And this recognizes the long history of capitalist civilization from 1492, but then again, especially after 1648 and the Peace of Westphalia, that the, the, the capitalism works according to a civilizing project, which sorts out some people, white, male, bourgeois, historically and overwhelmingly, and then puts not just the forests and the fields into the realm of nature, but virtually all of humankind into the realm of nature, the better they could be cheapened and their work, their lives, their labors devalued. So as I often remind my students, um, this is not a history of European advance since much of Europe was in fact excluded from the definition of civilized. And as I always point out, the Celtic and Slavic peoples were the original third worlds. And so this is very important to keep in mind as we walk through the capitalist scene, because the capitalist scene is not a, a, a definition of an economic system. It is a geopoetics. That is, it is a provocation to the man versus nature cosmology of today's popular anthropocene. There is another Anthropocene, a geological one, that is distinct and we can discuss it. But when I say the popular Anthropocene, I mean the interpretation of modern world history, including today's climate crisis, 
as the outcome of man versus nature held together by technology, by markets, and driven as ever by the tendency towards overpopulation. All of these are fantastic fetishes in a classical Marxist sense. They are also the building blocks of bourgeois ideology that tell us, whatever you do, do not name the system. And this is a way of thinking that has very deep roots in modernity, but its classic exposition is Thomas Malthus at the end of the 18th century. And Malthus's greatest contribution was not to argue for the centrality of population growth in itself. That was part of it. Malthus's greatest contribution was to explain capitalist inequality in terms of natural law. And this is what the popular Anthropocene and most mainstream environmentalists embrace. They embrace an external conception of the web of life, rather than understanding that, yes, the web of life has certain historical natural laws. That's true. The Earth orbits around the sun. The Earth has wobbles, both of which, by the way, impact climate history in major ways. But the history of humankind is not of man versus nature, but of humans and social relations in the web of life, not and the web of life, but in the web of life. And that human social relations are always making environments and are always being produced by those environments. And this is what we talk about in world ecology as an environment making dynamic in which class societies, capitalism, for instance, today has produced the climate crisis and the climate crisis is producing the conditions of capitalist crisis today. So that's at the core of the capitalocene intervention. It argues not just intellectually, but also politically with mainstream environmentalism born more or less around 1970 with the first Earth Day in the United States, which says the problem is humans versus nature. We say, no, this problem of climate crisis is not anthropogenic made by humans. It is capitalogenic made by capital. If we cannot name the system, we cannot forge a climate justice politics that will guide humankind into a new era with relative justice, sustainability, and democracy. And this is all very important because the capitalist scene, as you have been hearing, is not an abstract formulation. It is a concrete, specific argument about the origins of today's planetary crisis, which in my view roughly begins in 1492 and the following centuries. And it is an argument about the developmental patterns of capitalism that have produced today's planetary crisis. So the capitalocene argument in particular and world ecology in general is not one of these academic arguments that says my conceptual framework is better than yours. If uh, uh, it is an argument over turning points and the concepts are designed to help us understand the origins and development of planetary crisis for a very, very clear political reason that whatever we wanna say about world history, it is always present in our climate justice politics, in our environmentalist politics. There's an old French expression about politics that I could say about world history, that while we may ignore world history, world history will never ignore us. So for the capitalocene thesis, it, it identifies not only the economic relations, but the relations of power and webs of life that transformed very early, very rapidly at the dawn of capitalism, producing the originary conditions for today's climate crisis. And as uh, you will discover in reading my, my work, that one of the original colonies, of course, was Poland with its vital uh, uh, agricultural frontiers that fed the Dutch capitalist nation, the great superpower of the 17th century that uh, supplied the timber 
and the naval stores, the pitch, the tar, and also the uh, potash derived from forests, which uh, enabled the bleaching of the textile industries of Northwestern Europe. So when we think about the origins of capitalism, we need to put the experience, especially of Poland, um, front and center to understand these relations of power, profit, and life. And when I say power, I mean not only political power, but also the geocultural hegemony and ideology of man versus nature. As you heard me talk about, Slavs were excluded from Europe. They were not regarded as civilized. Uh, the same with the Irish, the same with the Russians, the same who are Slavs, I realize, uh, the same with African American or African slaves, the same with indigenous peoples, um, and of course, the same with women. So what happened in the origins of planetary crisis was, as Silvia Federici reminds us, right in the heart of the most intense period of the Little Ice Age between 1550 and 1700 was a gendered counter-revolution that was advanced by bourgeois interests to secure the necessary sources of unpaid work. And this is where I want to end my introduction to the world ecology conversation. That for us, capitalism is not only a system of bourgeois and proletarian narrowly conceived, it is also a system of socially necessary unpaid work delivered in the words of Maria Mies by women, nature, and colonies. So the unpaid work of women and other webs of life um, uh, defined ideologically by capitalism as nature, and that's something we should resist and revolt against, um, help clarify that capitalism is not only a money system, it is also a system of power that appropriates the unpaid work of humans, overwhelmingly women, and other webs of life. So there is a connection between paid and unpaid work and between the work of humans and the work of extra human natures, the web of life as a whole that is at the center of capitalism. This is not an abstract exploitation of nature. This is a class dynamic of appropriation, um, usually by moving to new frontiers of unpaid work. That means that frontiers have been central to the ways that capitalism has developed technologically, economically, politically, and of course, environmentally. The question today is what happens with, when capitalism no longer has frontiers? In my teaching, I, uh, uh, I teach the work of another one of your uh, um, uh, countrymen, countrywomen, Rosa Luxemburg. And Rosa Luxemburg's famous critique of Marx on the closed circuit of capital uh, and, uh, is relevant here because what she says is that capitalism survives only through an open circuit of capital by moving to frontiers. Today, those frontiers are essentially gone. And I can go into detail about it, but let me say this, that what we would expect um, with the closing of the frontiers would be growing problems of the valorization of capital, of the accumulation process, that's exactly what we see, and the redistribution of wealth and power from poor and working class people and countries to the very rich, that's another. And that in the midst of this, we have to remember that the frontiers in, in, uh, that have been enclosed are also the atmospheric frontier, that capital has enclosed the, the atmosphere as a dumping ground for greenhouse gases. The costs and the consequences of that enclosure are now coming due, fatally undermining the agricultural revolution model of producing more and more food with less and less labor time that is at the heart of capitalism. So this question of the front end of the frontier, the end of cheap nature, and the severity of the climate crisis today have to be put together in a new internationalist politics of climate justice that puts this, these relations of paid and unpaid work at the center and the, uh, the potential unities of uh, working class humans and webs of life put to work for capital. There is a possibility for understanding the, the challenges of a revolutionary climate justice 
program in unifying the differentiated realities, the differentiated but unified realities of proletariat, femitariat producing unpaid work for care and social reproduction, and the work of nature as a whole, the bioterriot. And to understand these constitutive linkages brings us to a potentially useful conversation over climate justice in the present moment. I think that is the contribution of the capitalist thesis. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned so many things that I would like to jump right into. The, your description of Poland in relation to other situations of other nations. Uh, the, what happens when capitalism